I would like to, uh, for you to give a warm welcome to Jochen Seitz, if you want to please come up, who is... Uh, <laughs> if I can call you Jochen, it's okay. Sure, always. He's director of Caring. He's chairman of the board of sustainable development and co-founder and co-chair uh, of the B team with, Richard, with Sir Richard Branson. Uh, Jochen served also for uh, nearly 20 years as head of Puma, which is a well-known company in the, uh, in, sports, uh, uh, in the sports area, I would say. And he pioneered groundbreaking environmental profit and loss account, EPNL, that puts monetary value on the impact across a business supply chain. He believes in contributing to a new paradigm of corporate social environmental sustainability. So the floor is yours. I think we will take a few questions also at the end. Sure. Is that okay? Yeah. So you can either stand here like Tony or wherever or you walk feel around. comfortable. Or Great. walk around. Yeah, I will. Thanks. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, my journey wasn't quite a 24-hour journey, but uh, almost. I just arrived uh, from New York where um, we had some very exciting meetings that I'm going to talk about in a minute. In fact, one to do with Harley Davidson and another one with the B team that Mr. Wasserman just mentioned. But as I was asked to talk a little bit about my own experience of and my own courage of redefining the purpose of business, um, I think I need to rewind about 20 years. My own purpose in business was actually to become a medical doctor because that was a long family tradition. So very early on I realized that breaking the traditional paradigm was part of, would become part of my career. So I was the first to get into business, not knowing anything about it. And my parents used to say, we have no idea what you're doing. It sounds pretty good, though. So after my initial uh, studies and work in the United States, I actually went as a 24-year-old to the US, worked for uh, an American corporation, because I thought that in the traditional corporate world in Germany, as a 24-year-old, I wouldn't be given much responsibility. I joined Puma at the age of 27. And uh, very early on, I had to realize that uh, redefining and breaking the traditional purpose of business once again was required in order to turn a company that was truly at the verge of bankruptcy into a profitable business again. So here I was, and I guess the biggest courage was initially the courage of our shareholders at the time to appoint a 29-year-old to become CEO of a public company in Germany that was just almost under receivership with 11 German banks managing it. For me, it wasn't really courage. I was kind of naive, I guess, and I never asked the question why that was so unusual <laughs> to put a 29-year-old in charge. But I put a team together of quite unusual business people. In fact, my chief marketing officer was a skateboard rider. My chief financial officer used to work in the warehouse and then did a second degree in accounting. My chief or deputy, as well as my um, chief product officer, was a ski instructor, truck driver, and later salesman. So I had a very eclectic group of people that all wanted to change and challenge the traditional paradigm of doing business. So taking a company that was actually used to sell low-priced shoes because the son of the founder decided that Puma was for the masses and it should be sold at 19 Deutschmarks a pair of shoes, we first had to clear the inventory and say, well, we are actually not about selling cheap shoes. So restructuring, re-engineering and all the things you have to do in order to reposition the brand, we did and we became, after nine years of losses, in the first year after the restructuring, a profitable company, re repaid our 100 million in debt and we're profitable ever since. But we also re realized that we have to, had to redefine the purpose of business, the purpose of the brand yet again, because just selling decent shoes, performance shoes, was really not taking us anywhere, simply because there were bigger brands, there were more powerful brands, there were others that were already occupying that space. So we sat together and came up with a plan that would refine the purpose of the brand. And we decided that we would not just be a performance, functional, boring brand, but become a brand that was cool and desirable. And that was, again, when we broke the traditional paradigm and actually stopped looking at our research because when we did our traditional research studies, which I was used to at my previous company, Colgate Palmolive, 
we were told that Puma was a cheap brand. It was a brand that should never attempt to be fashionable, nor should it ever try to sell to women. So we said, forget that. It's not a good idea. We shouldn't listen to our research, because if we do that, we'll be stuck where we are. So we threw that out and said, well, we will become the coolest brand. We will become the most expensive brand. We will become a fashionable brand, and we'll become desirable again. So we went to Hollywood, put our shoes onto Madonna, brought in fashion designers, cool designers that were all you know, part of the street, design culture, and remodeled the brand for the first time to bring lifestyle to sport rather than trying to be just sport. And that's when the word sport lifestyle was born. So we broke the traditional paradigm, the traditional purpose of the brand. We repositioned Puma as the brand that mixes it up between sport, lifestyle, and fashion. So we became the most profitable brand and grew our business from back then 100 million loss making to 3 billion euros in sales over the years. But in that journey, we realized that our purpose was too singular. Fashion, lifestyle, sport, great, but at what expense? We realized that the supply chain that we were using all the way throughout our factories was actually not a clean supply chain. And Puma is a brand that carries an animal in its logo. So wasn't it a natural thing to also ask yourself, isn't nature important to the brand? So before CSR became a buzzword, we said we have to clean up our act. We have to look at the standards in our factories. We have to look at the social standards. But we also have to look at the same time at, at nature's impact or the impact of our business onto nature. So we started to clean up our act, became a responsible business, until we felt that wasn't good enough. Because a responsibility is not really something that allows you to necessarily innovate, or at least it doesn't take an organization forward in an innovative way. So we decided to once again redefine the purpose of the brand, to make it not just the most fashionable, cool and sporty brand, but to actually make it also desirable from a sustainable perspective. Yet again, big eyes in the, in the company, in the big business, and usually when I encounter, what I encountered in my business career was when we had the path of the hardest and most resistance, it was usually the right path. So, so much about breaking the business uh, paradigm, the traditional business paradigm. So we said, let's be Let's innovate around sustainability. Let's not just look at it as a responsibility. So what we did was we refined our mission. We wanted to be the most desirable and sustainable sport lifestyle company. And we created a new vision, a Puma vision of a better world, a better world that from our perspective was more peaceful, more safe, as well as more creative. And those three ingredients of being creative, innovative, allowed us to use the sustainability aspect to really change the way we were doing business. And almost no time we re-innovated the brand and put sustainability onto an innovative platform. We set tough targets for our business, but we also set tough targets for our products in terms of biodegradability, in terms of sustainability, recycling in terms of nature's impact, and that's when we just, Mr. Wasserman mentioned, we came up with the idea of actually measuring our environmental footprint. I truly believe that what you don't measure, you don't really manage, and we are all looking at, as business people at bottom lines and top lines and margins, but what about nature, what about society? Of course, one could say, is that really ethical to put society and nature into metrics? Well, you could say, is business ethical? Why not? If it helps us businessmen or women to actually innovate as we realize while we are measuring our impact, we can start innovating and finding solutions to our negative impact, I truly believe it's very worthwhile doing. So the concept of the environmental profit and loss actually looks at environmental impacts, such as land use, carbon, use or creation, pollution, uh, uh, waste, etc., and puts it into relation to each other. And we realized after we innovated with the first environmental profit and loss that our annual footprint throughout the supply chain was 146 million euros. So with over 300 million in profit, our supply chain alone was generating a loss for nature. And if nature was a service and said, 
you better pay me for the damage you do, we would have to pay together with all of our supplies 146 million annually. Now the same thing you can do at looking at societal impacts that business has positive, creating jobs, but also negative when you look at some of the standards throughout your supply chain. So I realized over time that after having been CEO for almost 20 years, that my mission became a bigger one. So becoming a board member of Caring, the company that had acquired Puma, that owns wonderful brands such as Gucci, Stella McCartney, Bottega Veneta, Saint Laurent, uh, uh, and many others, we should try to do the same thing in our mothership. Why not? And so we did. And Mr. Pinot, who is the, the owner, majority shareholder with his family in caring, formerly known as PPR, signed up to the agenda. Yet again, big eyes, because imagine standing in front of CEOs of luxury brands that now think you are the sustainable Taliban, as somebody once <laughs> called me, <laughs> trying, to, trying to convince them that sustainability was actually an opportunity. And that's the key thing. It is an opportunity. You have to look at it as an opportunity because if you don't, you will not find the solutions to the massive problems we have. Business is part of the problem. I came to realize that over my years in business, but business is also about solving problems. So let's solve problems. And simply what we did, we looked at luxury and said luxury is all about tradition, heritage, longevity, quality. Well, there you go. That's sustainable, isn't it? What is not sustainable is not good quality. And then everybody said, well, yeah, that makes sense. We are better than the fast-moving brands. We are all about craftsmanship, history, heritage. We preserve. And that is now something that every luxury brand can relate to. And we've created a truly inspiring initiative with over 15 million euros in annual contribution from the mothership in order to support sustainability initiatives throughout the various brands that are now collaborating to find sustainable solutions. Then I became a board member of Harley Davidson. Now you could ask, what am I doing here? And of course, Harley is all about the sound and the smell of the Harley Davidson, isn't it? So I began, became the Taliban again in a sustainable way. I decided to chair, actually create a sustainability committee on the board, which I'm still chairing today, such as for Caring and other companies. And we went about redefining the Harley Davidson brand again and try to translate sustainability into something that would truly be embraced by the hog owner. How did we do that? Well, Harley Davidson is about preserving and renewing the Harley Davidson ride. Preservation, renewal. The Harley Davidson brand went through a lot of uh, history, 111 years of history now. Good history, difficult history, turnarounds, innovation, and we said, great, that's the basis. Everybody understands. And what became first a big question mark turned into the solution. So one of the reasons why I was in New York was because we just, after five years of work, launched the first electric Harley-Davidson. So, uh, that was a big one for me because to turn such a traditional brand into something that would see an electric Harley as an opportunity, knowing that the traditional hog owner is not necessarily the electric enthusiast, was a big one. <laughs> but if you hear this bike, and if you look at the bike, it's totally Harley. And the PR value of just that message was probably worth $200 million within three days. And it completely revitalized the image. And what was once a question mark of, can Harley attract the next generation, became, how can I get this bike? That's the first Harley I want to have. So again, you turn sustainability into something which is desirable, which makes sense for your brand. It's not just a buzzword out there that means little. You're translating it into the DNA of what you're doing in business. And that's what we are trying to do with the other initiative, which I just co-chaired with Sir Richard Branson yesterday, which is called the B Team. And that's maybe the last chapter in my sustainability journey that I'd like to talk about. There won't be much time to talk about my foundation, what I'm doing in Africa, uh, trying to make tourism sustainable at the same time. Maybe I'll leave that for another speech at another day. But the B team is actually trying to change business for better. And it's actually the B doesn't stand for Branson, it stands for better business. 
<coughs> I made that show because I came up with a name. Um, and what we said is, let's bring individuals together that have already proven that we can change things through business inside out. So we brought 16 business leaders together from Nobel Peace, uh, Prize uh, laureates to Ariana Huffington in media, Mohamed Yunus, uh, uh, microfinance, Paul Pormann from Unilever, Richard, myself, and many others from around the world, more Ibrahim from Africa, and Gozi, the finance minister of Nigeria, and, 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 in order to really try and redefine the role and purpose of business. So here again, now we are trying to take on traditional capitalism and try and redefine it. And we believe that based on the experience each of one has had in our individual business, we know where we have made mistakes, we know where we've done better, and we believe that we can collectively, together with others that will join the movement that we are starting to create, will be able to have a contribution towards a better way of doing business. A, a way of doing business that is not just profitable from a financial point of view, but also from a social and environmental point of view. So the B team's challenge is manifold, as you can imagine, and we've just defined the four key challenge areas that we would like to take on, and that I'd like to conclude my, uh, my speech on. The four challenges that we believe are key, and where we believe we can actually impact business to become better, are the future bottom line. If we don't measure what we won't manage. So redefining how we can actually manage and, and put metrics to the way we calculate in business is critical. So the future bottom line, as to the triple bottom line that John Elkin, the co-author of my new big book, which is coming out, a little bit of advertising, in August, uh, 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 we believe that we have to start putting measurements and metrics towards the business so that we can all visualize, because not all of us had an epiphany, not all of us believe uh, in this new way of thinking, not all of us meditate, not all of us become missionaries, not all of us believe that business should change. But when we realize and measure our impact, we will automatically start changing and we can filter down in our organizations. So the future bottom line is one of the key challenges. The future of incentive is another one, because we believe that without incentivizing business, it will be difficult. We have perverse subsidies in fossil fuels. We don't have enough incentives for good products to be sold. If we look at import duties today, actually materials that are less sustainable are, being, are benefiting from lower import duties than, than materials that are more sustainable. So creating innovation just like Subsidies towards solar, the solar industry have, have started a, a whole new sector. We believe that incentivizing business is critical. Hence, we want to work with governments in order to define what these incentives are. So rather than trying to say, we got to get rid of perverse subsidies, which is a battle you may not win against those who are much more powerful and bigger and have more at stake monetary-wise, uh, and trying to take on the whole world, we say, well, why don't we start with incentivization? So incentivizing business, it's all, and that's the third uh, challenge, it's all, it's all coming down to leadership at the same time. I think all of us have experienced that without leadership, it ain't gonna happen. So it's important that we create that new leadership, that we get others to join, to join a new thinking of a more sustainable business, of a better business that is more equitable in every respect, socially, environmentally, and financially. It comes down to education, it comes down to gender equality, it comes down to empowering people, it comes down to, to, to new ways of doing business. Social enterprise was something that we just discussed with uh, Sir Cohn yesterday. It's some say, well, it's just a new way of philanthropy. Well, it is not. In fact, uh, you can put clear metrics behind social enterprise and actually prove that a lot of things that we are doing uh, from, from a from an, uh, governmental and business point of view may actually be better off if you apply social enterprise metrics and may become even as profitable as traditional ways of accounting. So n the challenge of leadership is important and the challenge of investment the future of investment as the four, fourth key pillar of our attack. 
investment because money flows are important, the way banks operate, the way, the way we invest, we just touched on it, social enterprise being one example. We have to also make sure that more money is getting invested into a new way of doing business. And if you look at those four challenges together, we believe we can actually move the dial uh, step by step by redefining sustainable development goals on a global perspective as well as by working with business leaders around the world that are willing to join uh, in this journey. So when it comes to courage, it's not really just about courage. Courage, it can be whatever you want. For me, it was never courage. I'm just a curious and adventurous guy and I like to change, challenge the traditional paradigm and I will continue to do so until Actually, not until somebody tells me otherwise, because they've <laughs> always done that in my past. Thank you very much. Jochen, thank you very much. Uh, you stay with me for yeah. the questions? Okay. Uh, maybe just one question for me. One minute on your African project. Very briefly. One minute. And then we will take questions, and I will hand over the... Uh, and we have to finish at 6.15. Then I have to give a small instruction. You should leave the room, because we have this... My uh, beautiful wife is coming for a piano concert, which I hope you won't miss. And we have to rearrange the room, so we will ask you to come to get out and come back at quarter to seven. But we still have about ten minutes, if it's okay, for some questions. Uh, and I give you the... And maybe first on the African project. Okay, sure. Well, um, I bought a farm in Africa many years ago, not knowing how much travel I would get myself into again. Uh, and I decided, it's 50,000 acres of incredible landscape, and I decided to turn, into, turn it into a tourism operation that had a new philosophy in mind. Basically, the philosophy that we came up with through my foundation, which is taking four C's into the core of whatever we do. And it's almost like the triple bottom line. It's conserving, it's about the community, it's about culture, and it's about commerce. So we're combining holistically those four C's into running a business, while respecting uh, evolving cultures, working with the community, as well as conserving uh, the land at the same time. Now that grew and became so successful um, that we decided to turn it into a global initiative. We ha have now 74 retreats around the world that are part of the alliance. It's called the Long Run Alliance with the goal to really make land-based enterprises that are primarily tu tourism-driven truly sustainable according to these four principles, according to the four C's, which we call the quadruple bottom line. And that ultimate goal is to, co to turn it into a brand so that uh, members can actually own this organization and, uh, and maybe some of you may want to join with any retreats that you have around the world. It's the Long Run Initiative. And what country is that? You're, you're well, mine is in Kenya, and, uh, and then the others are all over the world. Thank you very much. So, first question. Um, my, my name is Thomas Dillick. I teach in St. Gallen at a business school. First of all, thank you very much for giving me, us, hope that in business things are changing and that uh, there are lots of possibilities to bring sustainability to the ground in companies if you want to do it. My question is, are you happy with the kind of students that you get from business schools? <laughs> <laughs> In doing what you do and what you have been doing? I think we are starting to see some change, but, you know, I mean, I'm spending a lot of my time in America, and I would say it's still in the, in the infancy when it comes to making sustainability not just another chapter in your education. I think we need to move away from you know, shared value and all these buzzwords, but really embedding it into the business opportunity and in, into marketing and, and redefining the purpose of business. And until we've done that and people see it as an opportunity, it is, will be difficult and it will be seen more as a responsibility. I think we need to definitely move away from the word CSR and, 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 and say, well, this is just the way business needs to be done if we want to sustain our planet and our society. So let's redefine it, and, and, and there's no better way to start than in business schools. This, when I went to business school, never existed, and I went to a pretty decent one. Uh, I think there's a lot more, and that's why in the, in the challenge of leadership, education, working with business schools together in order to redefine the curriculum, um, uh, I think will be critical. Too many still say, it's all about making money, I don't care about the rest but I think with the next generation, we will see a big shift as well. Can I? No, okay. Um, yes, that's hard. 
Um, can I ask you, in the B team, in what way are you dealing in the challenge of leadership with female and male aspects? I'm particularly saying aspects of leadership. How do you integrate that? Um, because I think it's maybe of particular importance for the future. Well, it's, it's we say gender equality. I mean, not just gender, in general equality for everything, regardless of religious, sexual, or whatever preference or beliefs. So, so we, we are defining, and in fact, Caring is taking a leadership role within the B team here because they are far advanced also with the foundation that they have set up as well as some of the initiatives. So we basically are setting ourselves goals all the way from uh, what's the percentage, male, female percentage in board representation, any leadership role within the business, mentoring, applying different principles to paternity, maternity leave, everything you can really do in order to not just look at men and women the same way, but actually differentiating as well. Uh, and what was interesting, just one example, you know, when we looked at what is your ambition in your business life, for men under the top 10 criteria, number five was making a huge career, a great career. For women, it became position eight. So when you put your HR manager to work and you now put, apply the same standard for both, you will never get anywhere because the ambitions traditionally happen to be still quite different. So we actually have to re-educate our HR uh, managers as well. We have to re-educate our headhunters. I mean, we were sort of looking when we were recruiting why we would always get 80% men in our recruiting, simply because the database of the headhunter is very skewed towards men. So it's not just by saying we, we need equality, it's about changing everything that gets us to equality rather than just changing percentages. And I think that's where we have to start and that's where we are also within the B-team corporations collaborating in order to quickly come up with ideas how we can instill that philosophy all the way from recruiting to career planning, uh, mentoring, as well as then leadership roles. Thank you so much. Um, the work that Puma has done on the EPNL is very well known and respected. I'm just wondering, in the caring group, are there companies or brands that have also done a societal PNL? I'm particularly concerned about exploitation of, say, migrant worker or slavery in supply chains. I'm wondering yeah. if you could talk about that a little bit. Yes, I mean, ca caring. Actually, all brands within the caring brands, 21 brands, have committed to an e to doing an EPNL. We coming to that in a second. 2016, we'll publish it, and we are working as the B team together with the World Business Council uh, of Sustainable Development to also look at the uh, societal PNL. Caring has done a, uh, um, a feasibility study, and on that basis, the B team will look into it. It's a lot more complex because you know monetizing human rights. How are you going to do that? You know, uh, but we believe eventually it's possible. Ultimately. We want more people to do EPNLs. Ultimately, we want to do SPNLs, but we also need to create a standard. So one of our uh, objectives is to look at you know, standardizing and helping so that when we talk about integrated recording, IARC, SASB, and other things, maybe one day we will look at you know, having one PNL that looks at all three aspects at the same time. That needs to be the ultimate goal. We are, as a B team, working towards that, not alone, but in partnership, because we are about catalyzing, supporting other organizations. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We are too small an organization. Organization. We want to help others in order to come to the forefront and, you know, and, and, and emphasize the great work that they are doing already. So that is in, in, in the making. Is B team becoming mainstream today? Or it is it still uh, it will become like the German summits? Um, in we are actually looking into branching out into a couple of uh, regions. Um, it comes down to funding because we are running this as a not-for-profit. Um, and we have two regions that have already indicated, or individuals that have already indicated that they would support a regional office. So we will be branching out. It's always a question of what comes first. You want to, is you become the TED first that is known and everything is clear. Your purpose, your vision, your mission is 100% clear. Everybody knows it. And then you branch out or do you say it's more open source. We want to be collaborative. We'll probably end up in uh, somewhere in the middle. B-Team was officially launched a year ago. I've been working on the idea for three years now. 
So uh, we will, I think we are on a good path. Thank you very much. Very impressive. Thank you. We need a warm Thanks. applause for Jochen. Okay, there was a last question, but uh, I didn't see somebody in the, r in the room. Okay, Jochen, sorry. <laughs> um, so I have a question. Uh, so you didn't... Oops. Hello, my name is Hannah Chung. I have a quick question for you. Um, um, I'm a social entrepreneur and a designer, and you did mention that uh, investing into social entrepreneurship is one of the key values in the work that you're doing. I'm wondering, when you say social entrepreneurship, is it mostly like nonprofits or have you invested into startups that have a social entrepreneurial mind? And what are, can you give us some examples like what have been done and have you seen a lot of innovation coming to help you help the work that you're doing with the B team? Um, I'm just trying to untangle myself here, sorry. <laughs> I'm not used to wearing a, a jacket, actually. I dressed up for you today. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's, um, it's still early, early, early days, but you know, we believe that social business, so we haven't, done an, we haven't made investments ourselves, but we're looking at impact investment funds and others that are doing the work to see what metrics they apply to their business to make it more mainstream. You know, we're, of course, also looking at B, B Corps, Naturally, there's a synergy between B team and B corps, uh, and, and how to you know change or add to the traditional purpose of business in a social environmental uh, way, and there are lots of examples out there, and we hope to be a platform where we can actually prove and show that those kinds of investment do actually make commercial sense when looked over the longer term. There are great examples in the UK, you know where. Um, businesses have sprung up or funds, social funds have, sh have sprung up and said we can reduce the rate of uh, relapse uh, into prison by 20%. We have four million pounds, you may be aware of it. Uh, give us five years. If we prove that we can re reduce about 20%, it means a saving of, let's say I'm not don't recall the number exactly, but it's probably a saving of 8 million for the, for the country per year. You then pay back the 4 million plus the investment, return on investment for our investors. So we are willing to risk the 4 million if we don't improve at all. But after that, you'll get us the money back and, and, and actually a fair return, uh, which is equal or better than any other return. And I think the success of that has actually shown that by applying business principles to social matters, and I'm sure the same will be applying to environmental matters as well, you can actually make the business case. Uh, yes, you have to have a longer term uh, horizon, but you can challenge traditional ways that we've never challenged before in a way that, again, uh, can return money for its shareholders. And I think that's the way we need to look at it. I personally believe that great ideas out there, philanthropy is important, but it's not gonna be solving the world's problem alone business has to step up to the plate because it's ultimately, if we consider 60% of all environmental damages are, are, are done by uh, the, the 1,000 largest corporations in the world, uh, well, you know you're not going to solve it with philanthropic money alone. So we need to collaborate and partner. And collaboration partnership is, is a principle that we as the B team also uh, uh, hold very highly because there are a lot of answers out there. We just need to listen to them and incorporate them in a business way, in a language that all of us as business people also understand because, you know, sometimes we think we're speaking the same language, but we are not because we are just wired in a different way. And to break that up, I think, culturally is also very important. 